Uh, you know, last week we were looking at the, at the Exodus, how God was set about to rescuing his people and how important of a, of a process that, that is and how challenging of a process that is and how they went, you know, they, we, we started through the, the different plagues uh, and what they mean, you know, the miracles that they happened, you know, the plague of the blood, the gnats, the, the flies, and how, you know, at first the Egyptians could copy and mimic them, and then they couldn't. And at first it affected both the, the Egyptians and the Israelites, and then God began making a distinction between them, separating them, saying, no, it's, no, it's only going to hit you now and not them at all. And we were, we were really focusing on the phrase last week about the, the passages that, so you may know, he keeps repeating that throughout the, the accounts, so you may know that, that I am Yahweh, so that mean, you may know that I have sent you, those kind of things. And we're going to be looking at it this week. Uh, again, there's some important things that we need to be a part of. It's in ex- starting in Exodus chapter 10. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that, here's the reason, I may do these miraculous signs of mine among them, uh, the way the, the King James puts it, he says, that I might show these my signs before him. And so that, that idea, so I may show, I can show you, so I can show them, and so he can show. That's what he's intending to do. God wanted to show Pharaoh something. He wanted to show his officials something and the Egyptians to see these miraculous signs. And the question then is why? What is God trying to accomplish? What is accomplished by God showing these things, showing his signs, showing his miracles to Pharaoh and his officials and all of God's power on display? What was he trying to show them? And in, by proxy, you know, what would he sh- try to show us through all of that? First thing is is that there is a a failure and a weakness of those false gods. You know, uh, uh, that's one thing that was pointed out. Each one of the plagues that come against the nation of Egypt are in some way attacking the deities and the gods of Egypt. The Nile, uh, the frogs, all of those different things. You know, they represent their gods with their with their people with the different heads, and you know, we have some that have the jackal head, some that have the falcon, all those different kind of things. Well, they represented their gods by the different animals and creatures, and they were supposed to be ruling over certain parts of life. And all of these plagues took every one of them down. So they were showing, he was showing the failure and the weakness of these false gods. Do we have any false gods here in this country? Yeah, we do. We have a lot of them. And we seem to think that they are better. We seem to think that we're smarter, that, that we've got it all figured out, that we don't believe in all of that, that superstitious stuff. That's what many in our country claim. But that's just as much of a false god as anything else. And God desires to show that the false gods that we have in our life cannot save they cannot provide they cannot do anything for us they are, they fail and they are weak and so in related to that it's not just that those guys are weak but he's showing the superiority the better that the god of the hebrews the god of the scriptures is better and superior stronger more powerful than anything that they put up in the way Anything that they try to worship instead of him. You know, Romans talks about that as well. You know, they, they, they throw aside the worship of the creator and they worship images created like uh, birds and animals and reptiles and, and men. We're putting those things in place of. We're worshiping the created thing rather than the creator. And so he is showing, showing how those things are fail. Those things fail. They are weak and how God truly is superior. And he's showing Pharaoh through all of this 
in all of these things, he is giving an opportunity. This is a call to repent as much as anything else. See, we seem, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that God is only dealing with the Jewish people here, that he is only dealing with uh, the, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, and he's not. He's also dealing with the Egyptians. He's dealing in the, in the Egyptians. Egypt represents the nations, represents just about everybody else. He is dealing with the nations and their leadership and stuff, and he is giving them an invitation. He is an invitation to follow him in truth, not in idolatry, but in truth. And this follows the same kind of message that you get, saw Paul give in Acts chapter 17 when he was in Athens, when he was invited up into the Areopagus, Mars Hill, and he was able to speak before the, the intellectual leaders of the day. When you look at that passage, look at what Paul, how he speaks to them, what he says, and how it parallels so much of what God is doing here in, in Exodus. He says, therefore, you know, he goes through these long lists of things, and he says, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. He, he was talking about them. You, you, I see you guys are very religious. You have all these idols and things like that. You even have one that's to the unknown God in case you, know, you, you don't want to offend him on accident, so you're just going to put it out there. And so, look, you guys don't know what you're doing, and this is proof. What you worship in ignorance, I'm going to proclaim to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you what's really going on out there. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Did the, Egypt, did the Egyptians have lots of shrines and temples and idols? Yep, they sure did. He says, neither is he served by humans' hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this, and it's so that, so they, this is that same kind of language that's used back here in Exodus. He did this for a reason, so they may seek God, might seek God, and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Verse 30 goes on and it says, Therefore, having overlooked these times of ignorance. Overlooked doesn't mean that he didn't notice, by the way. Overlooked just means that he allowed and permitted and didn't bring the judgment immediately. He was patient with them. He says, God now commands all people everywhere to repent not just the Jewish people who need to repent. It's all people in all nations that need to repent. He says, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That is an awesome, awesome presentation that he makes there. Some of the things that you want to notice in that passage when you go look at it is that it is possible for us to worship in ignorance. It is possible for us to worship falsely. And we shouldn't necessarily think that because we're here in Pleasant Grove Baptist Church that we worship everything the right way. There are things that we can do in ignorance and not be in spirit and in truth. That's why we examine even everything that we do. We should examine it by what the word of God says. We can worship in ignorance. But the great thing is, is God doesn't want us, stay, want us to stay that way. He doesn't want us to stay worshiping in ignorance. He wants us, he desires, he seeks after people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, we learn also from this passage that all people are descendants of, from, from Adam, and none are superior or better. He is the one who 
sets the boundaries. He sets the, the points, the times, the boundaries where they might live. So we are born here for a reason. Who your family is, all of those things, he is the one that is in charge of all of that. We are not better because we're here in America. Because, again, we can worship in ignorance just like everybody else can. So he sets the boundaries. He sets the times for them. And the reason is he did this. His desire is that we might seek after God. That we might perhaps even be find him. Because do you think God wants to be found? Yes, he does. God wants to be found. He is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not, uh, he's not playing hide and seek with us. He wants to be found. Have y'all ever played hide and seek with a, with a, uh, a young child? You know, there, there comes a point when they get old enough and they, they get, try to get really good at hiding where they don't want to be found, and then they'll be like disappeared for two or three hours. But usually before they get that age, they go and they hide in a place that it's pretty obvious where they are. You know, they'll come over here, okay, I'm going to play hide and seek. They do that because they really want to be found. God wants to be found. He's not hiding so hard and despite all of the claims that some people make, well, if God's really there, he should just make himself obvious. You know, if you have eyes to see, he is obvious. He is obvious. He's standing right in front of us. He is not far from any one of us. He wants to be found. And then he says he commands everyone, all people everywhere, to repent. We, we all need to do that. We all need to repent of the idolatry in our lives. We all need to repent of, of, of where we were before and come to him and call upon the name of the Lord. That's what giving our life to Jesus really means. We are commanded to repent. And so that we are covered by the blood. We are saved at that point. But does that mean that, that, okay, well, now that I've repented and I've given my life to Jesus, that I don't need to repent of anything ever again? Is that what that means? Uh-uh. Because there are things over time that God deals with us about, right? There are things that he's going to sanctify. He's going to make holy in us that, that he's going to point out to us. Even years after we've been a believer, it's like, you know what, this part of my life is still not right before God. That doesn't mean I've lost my salvation, but that means that God says, by the way, you need to repent and get that out. That's no longer appropriate. It never was appropriate for you, but now is the point where you're starting to see. He commands everyone everywhere to repent because there is a day of judgment that is coming and it's against all peoples it's uh, against all nations that he is going to do that and the defining issue is going to be the resurrection the resurrection of jesus is the defining point because he is the one who dies in our place he is the one who brings life he is the one who received the punishment that we deserve you know, the curse of the law. But he is raised to a new life. And he is raised is so that we may know and experience the blessing of all that God commands, everything that he has in there, the resurrection. Life is the miracle of freedom. Life. The death that judgment brings, that's the curse. But in obeying God and showing that we love him, that is where our life really is. Okay, so it's, this, is, this is a time of great miracle, what we're seeing here in Exodus. It's a time of great miracle, and it is an invitation from God 
to, to leave behind uh, our idolatry. To leave, repent of those things and to leave that idolatry behind and worship him in spirit and truth. Worship him only. So as much as God is, is rescuing the Israelites, he is reaching out to the Egyptians. He is reaching out to the nations and inviting them to come with him to leave behind the false gods, to pursue after the true God, what you worshiped in ignorance, God wants to show you and show you the right way. Not just show you what you're doing wrong, but to show you what is right. Consider this. I mean, surely God at some point is going to show America her ignorance and her idolatry. Y'all believe that? Are we, ex- are we exempt from God doing this? No, we are not. We shouldn't think of ourselves as being exempt because guess what? God will correct you. We as America are not exempt from, from the work of God. And what do you think that lesson is going to be like? Was it a pleasant lesson for the Egyptians to learn? No. No. It wasn't. Does that mean that he doesn't love America or Americans? No, in fact, it actually says more that he does. He does this because he wants people to seek him, to find him, to reach out to him in his miracles. Even in his judgment is a call to repentance. See, when a, a nation or when a generation fully embraces idolatry, It's going to take the miraculous to shake them out of it. It's going to take the miraculous move and work and power of God to to get us out of it. We've got to realize that 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 is in order to get us out of idolatry, oftentimes he has to discipline us and he has to judge us and even judge our nation. It can take a lot to shake people out of their idolatry. How many people have you seen cling and hold on to what everybody can see is wrong in their life, but they don't want to give it up. Y'all have seen that, right? They're clinging to it, even though they think that maybe they think it's, it's what's best or what they want. But it's something that's destructive. God is going to try to take it out. Considering where the United States is, what is it going to take to shake us out of our idolatry? That's a bit of a scary question. Because in a lot of ways, you know, we, we disguise our idolatry better than Egypt. But we are no less idolaters in this country. We have turned no god into an idol. We have turned an unknown gods into idols. The, the agnostics or the, the nuns or the different categories that people say, oh, I, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious or whatever. All that different kind of language that you see out there among people. That's no less idolatry than somebody who has a a carved statue sitting on their sink or their counter. Okay? We have turned even sports teams and entertainments into our idolatry. We've turned the American dream into an idol. We are deserving of God treating us just like Egypt. We deserve that. And it can be just as devastating. But the thing is, it will save some. That is his goal. That he might save some because even eventually, even the Egyptians started to believe. Even the Egyptians began to figure this stuff out. That, wait a minute, when God says something, when Moses comes and says the Lord is going to do something, they started to figure out he means it. And they started to believe them. That's why you had the Egyptians, even officials of Pharaoh, you know, when he went back a a chapter or so, uh, back in chapter 9, when when, uh, they heard the proclamation of Moses about the hail, that was going to be coming. That anybody who leaves their cattle and their servants out in the field, they're going to die. That's why you had a whole bunch of them say, they went out of that room and they went, guys, 
Uh, start bringing them in. These were the Egyptians who were starting to bring in their servants and their cattle because they heard that Moses said that the hail was coming. And it saved their lives. They were starting to believe what was going on. That's why they even started trying to get Pharaoh to leave them, let them go. How, can't you see that Egypt is in ruin? As long as you keep this up, this is not going to end well. Get them out of here. They're starting to believe. That's why they realized that the gods of Egypt were no match for El Shaddai. They were no match for God Almighty. They were no a match for Yahweh Elohim, the king, the, the, the creator who keeps his word. Through his miracle, even his people, his people, the Israelites, were being the light of the world. Right? Aren't we supposed to be the light of the world? Okay. What was one of the plagues that's coming up here? Wasn't it darkness? Wasn't it darkness over the entire nation of Egypt except the people of God who had the light? They were not walking around in darkness. They were not walking around in that ignorance. They were not walking around in that idolatry. God was showing that these, my people, are the light. While the Egypt was in darkness, the Israelites could see. And so they were personifying the gospel. Because the light is always supposed to draw people out of darkness. That's why you see in chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 37, it says, as they were coming out, you know, the Israelites, they were traveling from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 soldiers or men on foot, besides their families. Okay? We got, you got to keep in mind, 600,000 men, that's not talking about the women, Right? So, and you've got to do more than just double that. Because in Moses' generation, what was happening in Moses' day? What were they doing to the, the male children? They were killing them. So do you think there would be more women than men? Yep. Maybe twice as many women as men, some say. They, they find some evidence of graves and, and things of that, where the ratio of male to female is like 60-40 or even 70-30. So there were more women than men going out. These were the fighting men. And then on top of that, you count the children who were not soldiers, who were not old enough to be counted as fighting men. You're talking several million people at this point. And then the verse goes on. Verse 38 says an ethnically diverse crowd, uh, a multitude of peoples, also went up with them, along with a huge number of livestock, both flocks and herds. So was it just the Israelites that left Egypt? It was everybody who was seeing these miracles that believed went with them as well. You think that included some of the Egyptians? Yes, it did. In fact, it included a lot of them. A lot of the Egyptians realized that, you know what? Not following, not believing their God is dangerous to my health. So they went out with them. All of those who went out with them, they were even invited to become a part of the people of God. They were invited to become essentially Israelites, to give themselves over to becoming the people. They were not forever cordoned off and say, well, okay, well, we are the Israelites and you're going to have to stay over there and you're never going to be one of us. They were invited to become a part of the Israelites. That's where they started talking about circumcision and other things like that. But you read about that. But see, it's, they, were, they were even invited to celebrate the Passover. It was only those who were not willing to give up their idolatry who were not allowed to participate in the Passover. When he talks about that uh, in, in Exodus 12, I don't have the, the screen up there. He says, many people went up out with him. Uh, with, um, let's see. 
verse 43 and such, he says it talks about re- regulations. He says, no foreigner is to eat of it. Uh, any, of you, any slave that you have bought may eat of it after you've circumcised him, but a temporary resident, a hired worker may not. You know, he's going into all of that thing. When he talks about the foreigner, it's talking about those who are not willing to give up their idolatry and serve the one true God. If you're going to keep your gods and, and keep that, that worshiping ignig- ignorance and stuff, then the Passover is not for you. You're not ready to put yourself under the protection and the covenant of Yahweh. But those who did desire to lay aside that idolatry, to place themselves under the covenant and the promise of Yahweh, were made full members of the people of God and all of the protections that that entailed. They were not second-class citizens at that point. They were made full members. That's what you see in verse 49. And so he says the same law, the same Torah, the same teaching will apply to both the native and the foreigner who resides among you. As the Egyptians were coming out of Egypt with them, if they want to say we are giving up our our belief in idolatry and all of Egypt's gods, we realize that your God is better, stronger, greater, and we want to become one of you. Then he says the same teaching, the same law, the same rights and privileges are going to be theirs as much as they are yours. Because God is about inviting his people in. He wants to show them. He wants to invite them. That's where we are. We are being invited in. We have been grafted into the people of God, right? We are not the native olive branch. That's how Paul talks about it in Romans, are we? As Gentiles. But we can be grafted in. And so we become just as much of the the olive tree as a regular native branch. And everything, all the rights, all the privileges, everything that comes with being a part of the family of God, the people of God, becomes ours as well. He does these things so he can show them. But there's even more than that. He does it... Verse 2, he says, not just showing, he says, and so that you may tell your son and your grandson how severely I dealt with the Egyptians and performed miraculous signs among them and so that you will know that I am Yahweh. He does it so he can show. He does it so they may know. This is a statement about the future. He's writing this. 2,000, 3,000 some odd years ago from us. This, but he's writing this statement about the future. He's talking about sons and grandchildren, uh, children off into the future, which is what we are reading about. You know, sometimes kids, they have a hard time believing what they hear about what happened in the past. Have y'all ever experienced that before? That not, every believe, not everybody believes that? How many of you remember... Uh, your grandfather or grandmother telling you a tall tale and you had a hard time re- figuring out which part of that is true and which part of it's not. Now, here's the other thing. How many of you are guilty of doing that? S- making a tall, fi- you know, a hunting story, a fish story, telling a, just a little bit of an exaggerated to, to see how much of your grandchildren, how gullible really are they? Yeah, you're laughing because you've done it. Haley, hasn't he done it? Yeah, he sure has. See, sometimes the generations, the children, the grandchildren that come after might have a hard time believing some of the things that we tell them. Because they haven't seen it with their own eyes. They haven't experienced it on their own. I mean, think about that generation of the Israelites. They had heard, it's been 400 years since the promise was given to Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob. They had heard about those promises about, oh yeah, you're the people of God. Oh yeah, the land, you're going to be up there in the land. Oh yeah, God's going to deliver you. Can you imagine being, you know, the, the second generation or the third generation? 
growing up your whole life hearing about these things that ha- did happen or are supposed to happen and they're not happening? And you go your whole life waiting for something to happen. Are you going to start wondering whether it's really true or not? Yeah, you might. You might start to wonder, start to question whether or not they, they're missing out on, the, on God moving in power. They're only hearing the stories about it. And then they might even die before they actually came to pass. This is something that's kind of concerning because, you know, it's been somewhere between two and four generations in America since the last Great Awakening. Y'all realize that? It's never taken this long for there not to be a powerful move of God that sweeps across the population of this country. The last one was in the mid to late 1800s. It's been a long time. There are a lot of people that wonder whether those stories about what happened that you read about in the Great Awakenings and things, whether those really happened. There's a lot of people wonder whether or not God is going to do that. When have we? When was the last time our own country has seen that kind of move? We can read about it. We can hear things. But have we seen it for our own eyes? Our children, our grandchildren, this is one of the things. They need something to show them, to let them know that those things that we are told about, about the powerful move of God in starting churches, in in growing churches, in in the, the Great Awakening type of moments, that they really did happen because they may have a hard time believing it. And they need something. And really, they need something from you to show them about the move of God in your own life. Some history, some record, something tangible that you can point to and say, you want proof that God has moved in my life. Here it is. This is it. Look right over there. The generations that follow need something tangible, some sort of record, some demonstration or answered prayer. You know, do you you keep a record of your prayers and then how how God has answered it? A journal, notebook, anything, just something, a scrap of paper that says, God answered my prayer about this. Do you have a a memorial or uh, of healing or of his provision of the powerful move of God? How it can, how can it be real for them if his hand is not real for you? You know, to, to aid, this is, where, this is where God has all of this stuff put together. This is where God knows better than we do. Because he plans this stuff into what he does. To aid them in giving them something tangible to remember, all of these miraculous moves of God, He institutes something powerful that only makes sense if it really happened. And it's so that you'll remember. He sets it up. He sets something up tangible to help them remember so that in the generations to come, they'll look back and say, this really did happen. That's the the Pesach, the Passover meal. If y'all haven't had a chance to study or look into and how that is practiced. Uh, we, we went through that uh, last April, and we went through the, the Passover meal and, and how that goes. And we'll be doing that again this year. I'll encourage you all to be a, a part of that. He, he does the Passover meal, and it's so that they will remember. He says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on, on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, I am Yahweh. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are, where you are staying, will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. So they were marking the doorposts of their house. He says, no plague will be among you 
to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day is to be a memorial for you. And you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statue. So again, it was a memorial. It was to help them remember. And it was something that they were supposed to be passed on for all generations. Something that in four, five hundred, a thousand years, if they're still doing the same thing, then they will remember that this is something that is not just a legend, it's not just a story, it's something that actually happened. Because it makes no sense for a people to invent a story like that. Oh, by the way, let me tell you how great of a nation that we are. We used to be slaves. We used to have it terrible. And our God was, de- you know, for 400 years, our God was defeated. And then he delivered us out of it. See, if that stuff, that's the kind of stuff that you don't talk about. If you're embarrassed about your family history or things that go on, you don't want to remind somebody every year of all the bad things that you used to do or what used to happen to you. Right? I mean, you tip, we typically tried to hide that stuff. They were putting it right out in the open. It only makes sense. You wouldn't invent that kind of history. It only makes sense if it were things that really happened. And it says that this is supposed to be a night of vigil. That's in verse 42. It was a night of vigil in the honor of the Lord because he would bring them out of the land of Egypt. This same night is in honor of the Lord, a night of vigil for all the Israelites throughout their generations. Now, here's where it gets interesting. You know, the so you will remember. You realize in Jesus' day they were still doing this. They were still doing the Passover. Jesus participated in the Passover. In fact, when it was since it was supposed to be a night of vigil, a night of vigil is where you stay up all night, right? So when Je- Jesus celebrates the Passover meal, they sing a hymn, they go out to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane, he goes off to pray, keep vigil, and then he comes back to the disciples and he finds them what? sleep they're not supposed to be sleeping none of them were supposed to be sleeping they were all supposed to be keeping vigil and so when jesus gets onto him he's like guys come on you've been doing this your whole life every year you're supposed to keep this as a vigil and stay awake all night and you're sleeping have you ever wondered and questioned you know, how is it? Because when the trial of Jesus was going on, wasn't, wasn't all that stuff happening before daybreak? You ever wondered, how was it they were able to get such a large crowd together before daybreak? I mean, most people are t- typically asleep. Guess what? They were already awake. And they had been awake all night. They were able to go and find those people that they wanted to, the ones that would condemn Jesus, They got the crowd for the trial because they were keeping vigil. They were all awake, keeping the Passover. That's what it was all about. And so the question is, have we forgotten? What have we forgotten? What are the things that God wants us to remember? What are the tangible things that he wants us to do and participate in to help us remember his mighty works and his powerful acts and his miracles? Because that's one of the things that our country and our, the people around us doubt, that no, that stuff didn't really happen. And part of it was because is we, don't, we, we don't even try to remember the way God wants us to remember. And I think that's contributing to the spiritual decline in our nation. Because the other thing is, is do we have a memorial in our, in our walk with Christ? Yeah, we do. Jesus built that in as well. The Lord's Supper is based on the Passover. It's based on that remembering. It's based on that story of you were a slave, a slave to sin, and through the blood of the Lamb, you are now set free. 
and you are safe. You have been redeemed with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Everything in the Lord's Supper is a parallel to what happens in the Passover. And so uh, you know, it is a memorial for us. And so as next week, as we're going to be um, doing the Lord's Supper, what is Paul, what, is, what are we called to do before we take the Passover meal, before we take the Lord's Supper? Aren't we supposed to examine ourselves? That's what 1 Corinthians 11 says. So a man should examine himself. In this way, he should eat the bread and drink from the cup. It is supposed to be a reminder to us. So between now and next next week, let me encourage you to do this, to examine yourself, to remember the great things that God has done, to call upon God, to create in you a clean heart, to realize that he is, even after we have been saved, he is still calling us to repent from our idolatry and the things that interfere with him, the things that we worship in ignorance rather than him. Because even in that, it's all an invitation to that repentance. He wants to show you and I our idolatry so we will turn to him till we may find him. And God is not willing. It is not his desire that we remain a slave to idolatry and deception. He wants to set us free. He will judge. This is one thing we have to realize. He will judge the entire world, the whole nation, to save some. To save all he can. He'll judge the entire nation. And we, as we talked about before, we are not exempt. And then when we see the move of God, we pass on that miracle of our rescue to our children and we create that legacy of faith that one day, Maybe if even in this generation we may see the mighty move of God in power as the Son of God returns for His bride. We've been waiting a long time for that, haven't we? Are there a lot of people who wonder if He's ever coming? Yes, there are. But there are things happening in this day that have never happened before. There are things in the move of God that's going on and around in the world. It's not, it's not America-centric. So there's a lot of things that God is doing around the world that are pointing to the possibility that it sure looks like it's going to be something close to this generation. It's going to be soon. And to that I say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. It's been a long time, but that, does that mean that he's not coming? No, it does not. Not in the slightest. And so let's keep remembering, let's keep passing that on and creating that legacy of faith and realizing who God is and what he seeks to do in our lives.